how I put the camera Hi guys. <laughs> so hi, welcome to um live broadcast today. My name is Maisel Lap and I'm here in my beautiful, wonderful condo in Waikiki. <laughs> and uh, I'm here to talk about a really cool topic. And it's so oh, sorry. I'm going to put it on live on Instagram too. So everyone can get on live together. Hi Art Pro too. Welcome. I think I have all my lives on. Okay, so um, my name is Mei Fingshin Hart. My name is Mei Gulag. Hi, Trey Chasen. Um, live in Hong Hawaii. I have a blog called YesFinanciallyFree.com, and that's where I'm actually broadcasting live right now. So if you ever want to catch a replay or know what kind of broadcast I do every Wednesday morning, I do a full broadcast of financial freedom. If you ever want to know in advance, if you ever want to know in advance what I'm going to be broadcasting about, I highly recommend you go to my blog, yesfinanciallyfree.com, Y-E-S, financial, with an L-Y, financially, and then free, F-R-E-E. I said, thank you. Yesfinanciallyfree.com. Go there, put in your first name or email, and you'll get email updates on all of these great webinars and everything. So, easier said than done. I'm not sure what you mean by that, but anyway. <laughs> so, um, like I said, I started this blog, yes, financial freedom, I about financial freedom. And the reason I'm so into financial freedom is because I really wasn't good with big money. Oh, financial freedom, yes. <laughs> yes, I agree with you. Um, I can definitely agree with you. So, if you don't know who I am or my story, back in 2008, uh, 9, 10, I had a lot of debt, uh, credit card debt. And then I started consolidating that on credit lines, personal credit lines, and then I had a lot of personal credit line debt and credit card debt, and I just my debt. And so I just kind of kept creating more and more debt for myself. Finally, um, I stopped using credit cards. I put them in a drawer. I don't want to use drawers underneath me. I put them in there. I stopped using them. And that helped a lot. And then I just started paying everything off. And eventually, finally, um, at the biggest point, I think it was about negative 30000 in debt. And my net worth was like around the same. I had zero savings and you know, nothing. <laughs> so I started finally in 2009, 2010, I finally started saving. I started learning how to invest. Hi, the Golden Rose Girl. Hi, Lauren Rich. Hi, Lush and Jeff. Welcome, guys. Welcome to the Wirecast. Yes, I've read the book, Richest Man in Babylon. Very good book. So um, I did start doing what Richard Van and Babylon said as well. I was saving 10% of everything I made. Now I took more than 10 but I started saving um, and investing it, creating passive income from it. And so by 2016, I paid off all that $30,000 in debt. I finally paid the entire thing off. It was completely debt free. <laughs> it was so cool. Because I had been doing like $1,200 a month in debt payments for a long time. And that was just very cool. So I paid it all off. Um, and also had back rent. I had so much debt. Like, I didn't only have credit card debt, back rent debt. How did it, wait, how did I pay off my debt? Um, well, that's like five, six years of time, right? So, it's like savings for three months, right? <laughs> and stop, it, it's amazing. If you stop making more debt and you just start paying it off and, you know, consolidating and paying it off, you eventually will pay it all off. <laughs> And I was investing at the same time, saving at least 10% of my money, created a passive income stream of $500 a month for my family, quit my job in December of 2016, and now what I do is I coach people on how to pay off debt, quit passive income, and invest at the same time. And you can, you'd be amazed at how much passive income you need to make per month to um, stop working a job or change a job, go part-time. Whatever it is for you. For me, I really wanted to be with my son, Jordan. He's four years old right now. He was three when I quit my job. And I just couldn't handle not being there for him as he grew up. And going to this job every day because I'm tired, not seeing him, it drove me crazy. So I quit that job. Hi, David Cardozo. I took on my first client in December of 2016 as well. Created my first finance freedom mastermind. Then I created two more. So clients come to me, we mastermind together. Sure, direct where we can talk. Um, message me. Hi, Elizabeth 8. Welcome. Hi, Finance IQ. Welcome, guys. Hi, Hollywood. What about Do I have to move somewhere cheaper? 
you still pay your bills, yeah, you just don't overspend, you start spending smarter, you reduce the amount of your bills, you consolidate that, you call all your bill collectors and tell them to charge you less, or you switch to other people. There's a lot of ways to reduce debt, reduce your payments, reduce your expenses. Tons of stuff you could do. <laughs> but anyway, one of the easiest ones is call your auto insurance providers, right? You're like, hey, I, I want a better insurance quote, and, and you usually you can drop your auto insurance really quickly, actually. Hi, AB3, welcome. Hi, well dressed, welcome. So, uh, what happened um, now is that I coach clients, right? I teach them how to create passive income. Most people have no clue how to create passive income. It's not that hard. I do most of it with dividend yielding stock. Um, now we're looking into investment properties. We're in escrow right now for investment properties here. But there's lots of ways to create passive income. You don't have to buy property. Um, Cryptocurrency, I have not successfully created past, that much passive income in cryptocurrency yet, but if you're good at it, it's great, you know. <laughs> um, title savings accounts are a great way to start creating passive income. Hi, Asher, they pay about 1.6% right now. You can Google them. So, anyway, my blog has tons of details on that. Yes, financiallyfree.com. There's so many blog posts in there. I've blogged almost every day for a year, and I've been blogging there for three years now, so it's like over 300, 400 blog posts in there, updated every week. There's lots of great information on how to create financial freedom. So go there if you want more details. Hi, Asher. So today's topic, which is super exciting, is the five laws of unlimited wealth from this book called Unlimited Wealth. All right, the theory and practice of economic alchemy. It's the heart. So this book is by Paul Dane Pilzer, recommended to me by Robert Kiyosaki, who wrote the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and the Cash Flow Quadrant. And actually, this is from the book The Cash Flow Quadrant. There is a section in there that says, if you want to be a serious investor, read these books. And then he lists a whole bunch of books, and I ordered every one of them, and I've been reading one a month. And this is the last one of his list. So I'm really excited. But every book in that list is amazing, all right? So this book blew my mind, just like they all do. So I wanted to do our webinar today on the five laws of unlimited wealth. So some people think wealth is limited, right? And it reminds me of this um, amazing law, this, uh, amazing law. I'm like, hi, D-U-H, go to my blog, yes, financiallyfree.com, and I'll have written out for you. Hi, go Ken Freed, welcome. So let's talk about it, and we're going to talk about the laws today. So um, if you want to read it, go to my blog. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to update it. It's not going to be yet. <laughs> update it tomorrow. But let's talk about the laws. So the first law of unlimited wealth. Ready for this? It's pretty cool. I love this one. Hi, Miriam. I'm them. Welcome. The first law, and I'm going to share my screen on my – I'm also broadcasting live on YouTube. Thank you for all my uh, live YouTube subscribers. So I'm going to share with you the laws of unlimited wealth that I have here. Okay. So the five laws of unlimited wealth. Let's begin. The first law, law number one of unlimited wealth. Hi, Pat Boy. Technology defines a physical resource. For example, land is not a physical resource until yes. Financiallyfree.com. Someone's asking my blog. Yes, with a Y E S in front. Yes, financiallyfree.com. Okay, so technology defines a physical resource. For example, land was not a physical resource until people learned how to cultivate it. I'm doing great. Hi, we're doing great live. Really welcome. I've joined your chat late. Can you please tell me what you're talking about? So we just started the first law of unlimited wealth, right? So let's talk about it. What does that mean? Technology defines a physical resource, right? There's a lot of people who think they know what physical resources are and what technology is. And honestly, physical resources, like we think that gold is valuable or fish or, you know, brand, right? All these things are considered valuable. Financial freedom is just not going to be I am covering the five laws. Oh, thank you, Drexel, for being so nice to share with the topics. <laughs> I was in CS also. So the only reason a resource is considered a physical resource is because people have the technology to use it as such. 
So he has a good example in his book of Palm. You go, if you were going back in time to an island in the South Sea, and for them, the, the biggest physical resources were fish and palm fronds, okay? Palm fronds from the palm trees, all right? Because they used palm fronds to make the roofs of their huts and all that. So palm frond technology and palm frond manipulation. Hi, good afternoon for you. It's good morning for me. But um, that is what used to be really important technology back then to this island, right? So the technology of how to take palm fronds and turn them into the roofs of a hut or turn it into a building was what made palm fronds important. So later when they learned to make houses from like maybe have tin roof houses or from wood or something like that, then palm frond technology died out. And then palm fronds were not a physical resource anymore. And now you're not wealthy because of the number of palm fronds you have, right? Does this make sense? So it's what the technology of the people is at the time that actually defines what physical resource is. Physical resource is not in itself a physical resource unless we know how to make it useful to us. And he says land wasn't a physical resource either. Land was not a physical resource either until we knew how to farm it and to create um, resources from it. Before that, land itself was not a physical resource. So all the things that we consider physical resources, the only reason we consider them a resource is because we use it for something. We have the technology, the knowledge to use this physical resource to create value for us. And that is what defines a physical resource. Technology. Right? So that is the first law of the human wealth. I think it's pretty cool. And it makes a lot of sense, right? So the second law of unlimited wealth is the supply. The supply of physical resources is determined not by demand or not by what is physically out in the world. The supply of physical resources is determined by technology. Okay, so technology again. Hi, G. Kelly, welcome. Let's go. Uh, so technology. Why? Because, number one, technology determines the efficiency with which we use our physical resources. For example, the fuel injector engine effectively doubled the supply of oil by doubling gas miles in cars, right? So when that technology was invented, the fuel injector, that made the supply of gas double for our purposes because we could use less gas, half the gas, to power, to power our cars, okay? So this is an example of how technology will determine the supply of our physical resources. The second reason technology will determine supply of physical resources is that it will determine the ability, our ability to find them, you know, find oil, obtain oil, distribute oil, and store oil. You could say that with anything. To find, obtain, distribute, and store whatever physical resource, gold, silver, and copper. Oil. For example, the Alaska pipeline doubled the supply of oil in the United States. So that's technology there. Hi, school, welcome. So the technology of creating that pipeline to Alaska, from Alaska and moving that oil doubled the supply of oil. The fuel injector is the engine have the amount of oil we need to drive a car. So there's all these different things happening. Now we have solar powered cars, which eliminates the need for oil at all, right? So if Soil, solar powered cars. Hi, Grisa, welcome. Hi, hi, and I welcome to the show. If solar power eliminates the need for oil in itself, then we don't even need, you know, gas. And then gas and oil might not be a commodity in the future, and solar power might be replaced. And then it will not be a physical resource anymore, like it used to not before the invention of cars, before. It combustible engines, before all that stuff, oil was not a physical resource. It was not important to us. We didn't need it. Okay? So technology defines what a physical resource is, and the supply of the physical resource is also dictated by technology. Right? They talk a lot about, he talks also about clothing. He's like, when we used to have clothes, actually, I'll talk about the washing machine. I thought that was interesting. He talked about the washing machine. He said, before they, we invented the washing machine, we didn't wash our clothes all the time. 
because it was such a hassle to wash clothes. They actually had these collars that were interchangeable that you would put on your shirt. So you'd take the collar off and wash the collar and put a new collar on because the collar got dirty in fact, right? And the rest of the shirt was clean. So you'd switch the collars off and wash those and keep the same shirt and wash it not as not as much as we do now. In fact, to have clean clothes every day and to have them smell nice is like because of the invention of the washing machine. So technology will determine what a physical resource is. It will determine, you know, what is important to us and how we use them. So now it's more important to have clean shirts every day. So instead of having just a few shirts and all these interchangeable collars, we have shirts with the collars attached because you can wash them in the washing machine. You can actually more efficiently have clean clothes. Hi, Meet Doug. Hi, welcome. Hi, Gora. Gora, welcome. So that's another example of how technology will create the supply of these resources. Now, interchangeable collars, nobody uses them. In fact, you listen to like they even existed at one point, and they did. And the only reason that we don't know about them is because of the invention of washing. There's a lot of interesting things in this book. This book blows my mind. But anyway, just to such as review, this book is called Unlimited Wealth by Paul Wayne Pilgrim, The Theory and Practice of Economic Alchemy. Right? So now we're going to go, and I'm going to have to stop sharing someone. I'm sharing my screen on um, my YouTube Live, but I didn't do almost live. So, <laughs> so I'm going to um, tell you law number three. So the third law of alchemy explains how the advance of technology is determined by the speed with which the members of a society exchange and process information. Okay? So each new advance in technology is a product of one or more other technological advances. Hi, Matsu. Welcome. And thus, the speed with which people exchange and process, this is the heart, the speed with which people exchange and process information about their technological advances is the throttle controlling the overall advance of technology. So technology has an exponential relationship upon itself. That is, advances in that technology multiply upon each other as each technological advance leads directly to the new technological advance. So what does that all mean? Hi, Vladimir. <laughs> Let's talk about the cell phone. I think that's the easiest one to relate to. So when people invented the phone, well, it's not called the phone. Okay? People invented the phone. And... Um, we and people were using a phone and a regular kind of phone back in the day. Now everyone uses a cell phone. Back then it was just a cordless phone, corded phone. And then they invented, and then technology improved on the phone. And they invented waterproof phones. And then suddenly people who had outdoor pools, now they had a waterproof phone by their pool and they had a phone in their house. So basically the need for phones increased because now there was a new kind of phone and suddenly people felt like they needed to have this waterproof phone to run it by a pool. Okay? So that instead of just needing one phone in the house, I'm have one by the pool. Um, then you have cordless phones where you don't need the cord anymore. You can walk around holding the phone. So then people go buy cord cordless phones, right? So what that means is as technology improves, people don't buy less, they buy more. Because they want better quality or more colors or more features of the same device, okay? Same thing with television. When televisions were invented, people would have one television in the beginning. Now people have two, three, four televisions, one in each room, you know? <laughs> like, and you want a television that's a huge television for your waiting room, a small one for your this room, you know, a big one in your bedroom, who knows, you know? So with the advent of technology and better, better devices, it's not that people buy you know, less. People actually buy more, right? So improvements in technology create a greater supply. And then he also, this law also says the speed by which people exchange and process information um, and each advance in new technology will create more demand. And now, this one's just saying that more technology creates more technology. Okay. Yeah. So, the more you, more technology you have, the more technology advances come up after that. So, like the TV, then you have bigger devices, like the cell phone. Now that we have the cell phone, now we have cell phone apps, now we have things like Lyft and Uber on our cell phones, and we can now 
you know, we can order food, we can order uh, a taxi ride, you know, it's called an Uber now, and we don't call it a taxi anymore, we call it Uber Lyft, depending on if you use Uber Lyft, right, to get a ride, right? This is all because of the cell phone. So the technological advance of the cell phone created the, uh, the next technological advance of the app, which created the next technological advance of like ride share, Airbnb, um, where you can go rent a room to someone with an app, right? So the technolo technology itself, the development of technology, as you advance it and as you share the information with others, you actually create more and more technological advances on top of each other. So technology expands exponentially. So that's what the third law says. The third law of alchemy, as we know, the first two laws say technology determines what a physical resource is. Technology determines the supply of the physical resource. Number three says technology expands upon itself and multiplies. As you create more um, technological advances, more technology builds upon that exponentially. And then he creates this rule, right? Um, and a formula. W equals PT to the nth power. W um, equals wealth. All right. So this is about unlimited wealth, right? So your wealth equals the um, physical resources times technology to the nth power. All right. And nth power is because technology will, has an exponential relationship with itself. Multiply that by physical resources and you get wealth. So the biggest factor in physical in wealth is not only the physical resources but also the technology. And technology is the largest factor because as technology improves, physical resources change. Right? Just like we were saying with the car, you know, you need oil and gas to run a car, but soon you're only gonna need a solar power, you're not gonna need oil and gas anymore. And suddenly oil and gas are not a physical resource that are important. And suddenly solar energy, solar panels, solar cells. That becomes more important and the creation of these high lenny cases. So, if that makes sense. So, those are the first three laws of alchemy. Let's go on or unlimited wealth. Let's do the fourth law of unlimited wealth. Hi, Jesus lives. Hi, Ms. Sylvia. And hi, Crypto Mentor. Welcome, guys. So, in conventional, okay, let's go on. In conventional economic theories, wealth is a function of only physical resources. Because technology is considered to be constant over a person's lifetime, right? This is kind of interesting. Uh, he said that there was this guy whose his father was born in a time when people would go to work in horse-drawn carriages, right? So they had horses, sell and they had carriages, and that's how they would go to work. He died after airplanes were invented, nuclear bombs were invented, you know, all of these other things were invented. So he was born in a time when there were horse-bound carriages. Hi, 12 Temo. Hi, Fire Squad. Um, I don't know. I'm going to ask him to find out if he's touched or not. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just let that go. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of technology in regards to him. That's what you're asking. Okay. As long as there is abundance of technology, as there is an abundance of physical resources, there will be an abundance of physical resources as well. However, the, an abundance of technology does not ensure that people will have everything they want. Okay? So, the fourth, as explained by the fourth and fifth laws, all right, which constitute the demand side of unlimited wealth and alchemy. Hi, Earth Seers, you're welcome. Thanks for joining. So, the fourth law of alchemy explains how there is an unlimited demand for products and services because technology determines what constitutes a need, right? So let's say that again. There is an unlimited demand for products and services because technology is what constitutes a need. And this law is entirely analogous to the role of technology on the supply side. Automobiles, better clothing, electronics, and virtually 95%. I-776, all that. Welcome to this. 95% of things that we need today are items whose demand is created by technology. The easiest thing to think about is the cell phone. Do you really need a cell phone? Right? And a lot of you are like, yeah. And the answer is no, not really. You could survive without a cell phone. Thanks for heart. You have a good example in here with, um, hi, Zara Lifestyle, welcome. So think about if you had a homeless person, what do they really need to live? Like to, 
to live. All right, try to grab 100. They just need to have a couple dollars every day to eat something, right? Okay? You can still buy enough food with a couple dollars a day um, to, to feed yourself, enough to survive and get some water. The wa there's a lot of publicly accessible water, so you really just need a couple dollars to feed yourself. Um, your clothes, you only need one pair of clothes, you know, um, maybe two, you know, to wash one. Pair. A lot of homeless. I mean, I know a lot of homeless who wear the same pair of clothes every day, right? You're welcome. So, what do you really need to survive in this world? It's actually not that much. So, the things that we say we need now, like cell phones, like um, electricity, running water. Uh, well, running water is pretty important, but we didn't used to need water and water. We used to go to wells and fill it up with buckets, right? So, the things that we need today are the result of technology. All right, because technology has advanced to the point where our standard of living has increased and increased and increased, our needs have needs have changed. Our real, real, real needs in order to survive and not die are actually not that much. But because of technology, what we perceive as a need has grown higher and higher. And as technology improves, what we think we need changes every day. Like now we think we need Uber and Lyft on our phones so we can get rides, right? <laughs> When we want to, not ever, not all of us. Some of you may not use, might not use Uber and Lyft, but do you understand my point? Okay. So needs change because of technology. Demand is created through technology. Demand is not something that already exists. See, that's what the thing about economics says. Economics says there's supply and there's demand. They're already kind of out there. Hi, good guys. Welcome to this book. And what this book is saying is. Unlimited wealth is saying that you create demand when you create the technology. When you create it, when the person who created the telephone created it, they created the demand for the telephone. All right? These people didn't know that they needed a telephone until it was invented. And then they suddenly needed a telephone. People didn't need a car until it was invented. Right? And now suddenly people need a car. Right? Because <laughs> they're they're moving out farther and farther away from their job, and hence they need a car to get to their job, right? Whereas in the past, when cars didn't exist, they just had to live closer to the job to get the job, right? They just didn't have this option of driving to work. So technology, the invention of it, creates demand, right? The creation of the apps, you know, apps on our phone suddenly created a demand for apps. Apps didn't even exist. Like I remember, you must remember when apps didn't exist. Maybe you know. Apps didn't used to exist at all, and now suddenly all these apps on phones and people, you know, now have a demand for bigger, for better apps. And one of these better apps is Uber, Lyft, Airbnb. Hi, Jafir One. Welcome to so, uh, I use Amazon Prime a lot <laughs> to watch movies and shows on my phone. Hi, Jafir Jojo. Thanks for seeing. Is it a need? Is a cell phone a need? You know, I didn't have a cell phone back when I was in debt in 2010 and all that. I didn't have a cell phone. You know, I didn't actually, actually, I did have a cell phone for work, but I didn't have my own cell phone personal. I just used it for work. And I just used it to answer and call. And I didn't even know how to text back then. I didn't start texting in 2000, 2013 is when I started texting. So I didn't start texting in 2013. Do we need Ola? Do we need to text? Do we need telephone? Do we need all these things? Very fascinating, right? Email, right? Didn't have email. Uh, email seems to be coming obsolete now, too, right? <laughs> so, law four of economic alchemy or unlimited wealth says that the technology actually creates demand. All right? So, demand doesn't exist by itself. Technology creates demand, and as technology improves, demand increases, all right? So, there is no limit to demand. The more that you make and the more things that you create, the more options, the more improvements, the more people want it because they want the bigger and better thing. Right? So that's the fourth law of unlimited wealth. The fifth law of alchemy or unlimited wealth explains how technology determines the level of demand for existing goods and services by determining the price by which they are sold. Hi, Henry, and welcome. So as the price goes down, the demand goes up. And in the alchemic world, demand is unlimited because of the shift from quantity demand to quality demand. 
For example, as the price of a suit goes down, person will purchase an increased quantity of suits. So when the price of clothes go down, you end up buying more clothes, right? So if, a, if one piece of clothes costs you a thousand dollars, let's say if you to buy one suit costs you ten grand. So how many suits are you gonna own? Probably just one in your lifetime, if even, right? But let's say a suit costs you only a hundred bucks. Suddenly you're like, I can have a blue suit, a gray suit, a black suit, a white suit. You know what I'm saying? I can have three black suits, so that one one's dirty. You know. <laughs> As the price goes down, you buy more stuff. You think that's crazy? It's, it's just true, all right? It's the same thing with cell phones, right? And other devices, things, computers. As the price is really high, you're only gonna own one, but if the price goes down, you're gonna be able to buy one and one. And then you're gonna be buying different ones and colors, to match your clothes, you know, high the emergency one. But you understand what I'm saying. So, with the improve, when you buy more suits, you then you buy more ties, you buy more suits, more shoes, you know, all these accessories, ties, the outfit, and um, you probably switch to a better quality suit. Since suits are cheaper now, you can buy the better ones. Thanks to my heart, you know, so you can buy better quality suits now, better quality ties, better quality shirts, better quality shoes, and the process goes over and over and over again. So. The whole modern economy is built on hi young ones, I'm welcome. Demand supply alchemy. Okay, if it weren't supply supply alchemy's ability to provide everyone with everything he or she needs, the basic survival would cause our economy to grind to a halt. And the reason our economy doesn't grind to a halt is because the economy, our economy, takes technology creates new demand all the time, it creates new supply, technology also dictates price. So he had a good example on how technology also dictates price. Um, this is all the laws. He also told, oh, there's a six law. There's six laws. Did I see five? There's six. Okay. <laughs> technology, there's another way that technology determines price, and I'll tell you how many right now. Hi, Ramon, welcome. So technology, if a price of something becomes too high, right? So let's say the price of gas and oil become too high, and we cannot afford to buy it anymore to fill this gas tank in our car. High heart twelve twelve. Let's say that happens. So then suddenly a lot of effort gets put into solar technology, and instead of just what we have now, hybrid cars and you know Tesla, the primary solar car, you know distributor and all that stuff. Instead of just that, now suddenly. Everyone, including government and everybody, is jumping into the solar game. Hi, So let's assume that gas and oil prices have skyrocketed to the max because somebody tried to monopoly, monopolize the price of OPEC did back then or whatever. And, you know, let's just pretend, right? We're not saying it's happening. Hi, Aunt me, welcome. But let's pretend that someone could corner the gas and oil market. You want to make it coming to the rate of price. And so now everyone's like, so now what happens is, Everyone runs to create the technology to make solar powered cars way easier to get, way easier to find, and they replace the need for oil and gas. And then suddenly we don't even need oil and gas because now everyone's using solar powered cars. So because the price of it went so high, technology went to find cheaper alternatives. Does that make sense? So that's how technology can dictate price. So if the price of some supply becomes too high, whether it's artificially inflated by some monopoly or for whatever reason, maybe we run out of it, maybe there's just no more gold in the world, whatever, whatever happens to be the thing that we run out of. Let's say there's no more wheat. Let's say there's some disease that kills off all wheat plants, we have no more wheat. We'll suddenly start using oat flour and felt flour and other alternatives to wheat, and then we start making bread and cookies with that and set, right? And then suddenly the demand for wheat is gone completely because we suddenly changed our technology to create cookies and bread from another kind of plant flower, right? So that's how technology determines price. Because if the pricing becomes too high, technology will find a substitute for that physical resource. Whether it be wheat or oil or gas or gold or uranium, whatever. Okay? So that is how technology dictates price. So if the price of something gets too high, technology will find a way to invent something else to Substitute. Okay, so that's how the fifth law of unlimited wealth 
work and how to come like high H dash one welcome. So the six law, right? Okay, so once we determine and realize that technology really does control nearly all economic activity, it controls supply, it controls demand, it controls price, right? Isn't that all of the economic activity right there? Hi, Ted, Ted, almost. Welcome. So technology controls supply, as we saw in the first um, two laws uh, on the mid well and outcome, right? And the third law says technology expands exponentially for itself. The fourth law is that demand is created by technology. And then the fifth law was that price is determined by technology. So we have supply, demand, and price, all determined by technology. Okay? So a physical resource is also determined by technology. Okay? So now that we know all these things, the sixth law, okay? Once you realize that technology controls nearly all economic activity, the most important question becomes, welcome to Aries, okay, welcome to, um, oh. hi Nico Shop, welcome, and I feel, so, um, what can, the most important question becomes, what can predict the immediate growth of technology for an individual, an industry, or a society? And this is explained by the sixth law of unlimited wealth, or alchemy, which explains the technology gap. The difference between the best practices possible with current knowledge and the practices actually in use. The technology gap is the sum of the ready to be implemented technology, of these RITs, ready to be implemented technology, that we haven't yet utilized. In order for an RIT to be literally ready to be implemented, it must be user transparent. It must not require any more skills for users than the product it is meant to replace. So he has he an example of a ready, um, ready to implement technology is the replacement of uh, what they call it, radial tires. By there, there used to be these tires on cars, and they used to be standard bias by tires, these standard bias by tires, and they've all been replaced by radial. And the reason radial tires replace black light tires is because um, they're better, all right? And they could replace them because all you need to do to replace it is to buy a different tire and stick it on your car. So it doesn't require any more knowledge. Hi, Phil, I did have here mom, thanks for the heart. It doesn't require any more knowledge to use a radial tire than a bias light tire. The same knowledge you need for both is to take the tire and stick on your car. So that technological improvement of the radial tire um, made it able to replace by supply tires with that. Because all you need to do is buy a different tire. But you had better tires. You know, they lasted longer, they performed better. So that's an example of a ready to be implemented new technology. It's already created, it's ready to go. All you do is replace something that's already out there. Okay, so that is an RIT. So depending on how the technology gap will determine how much wealth you're going to have, okay? So there is a gap between the amount of ready to be implemented advances, technological advances, and what we're actually using now in society, okay? Um, so that's how uh, you can tell the growth of what can predict the immediate growth of technology is the gap, okay? So as you guys all know, there's always people inventing new things, right? They're always working on things in universities or in companies. They're working on new devices, new technologies, new apps, new whatever, things that we haven't even thought of yet, right, to give to people to start using. They've already created it. It's just that we're not using it yet because we don't know about it. They haven't launched it. You know, they, you know, just people don't know yet, right? It's the same thing like using cell phones and things. Here in the United States, I remember back when they first started being used, back I was living in Taiwan and Asia, they had cell phones everywhere. But in the United States, they didn't have cell phones everywhere because it hadn't been widely adopted yet. Okay? So there are a lot of technologies out there that not everyone is using yet. So the gap, the gap between the technologies that are already made and are out there between what is actually being used, that gap determines your wealth. Determine how much wealth and potential growth you're going to have in your economy. Hi, Kimsey. So he also has examples of like 
countries, some countries, like I said, the United States didn't used to use cell phones that much. And I remember back when Japan and Taiwan, I was living back there, they were using it all the time when I came here. And nobody was using cell phones. That was not that long ago. You might think it was a long time ago. But now everyone in the United States seems to be using cell phones. But there was a time when people were not all, not everyone was using cell phones in the United States. So um, that was a technology gap between Asia and actually the United States. Now, uh, we have a lot of technology gaps as well, not only between Asia and the United States, we also have technology gaps between the um, United States and Europe, or Europe and Africa, or Asia, different parts of um, the world have different technology gaps. So this will determine how much economic growth we can have as well, because the technology could be introduced into other countries, and they can start buying stuff too as well, which would create more demand, you know? <laughs> and more wealth for people selling and supplying and jobs created in the industry and all like that. Hi, New York. Hi, Spotify. Hi, Mehmet. So that's the six laws of unlimited wealth. I will be writing this up in more detail on my blog, um, yesfinanciallyfree.com. So check out my blog. Um, I also have an email list there. You put in your first name and your email. Uh, I send you updates on all of these webinars I do every Wednesday. So some of you pop on live, you have no idea what I'm talking about until you get on the live. If you join my email list, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about every Wednesday. I email out the topic and what I'm going to be doing and stuff like that. You can also email me questions or topics you want me to cover or anything else from my email list. So when you go to my blog, yesfinanciallyfree.com, so Y-E-S, financially, Free.com. If you go there, on the right side, you put in your first name, your email. That gets you on my email list. So you automatically get a free working parent's guide to financial freedom, which is all the principles that I use to create passive income while I had all that debt. I paid up all my debt, and now I have passive income and I'm generating more. And all the principles on how to do that are in that book. It's a free ebook you get once you subscribe to my email list on yesfinanciallyfree.com. So I highly recommend you go there. If you're on Periscope, it's just the link in my profile. You just have to click on it. It takes you to my blog. So that's how easy it is to read and subscribe to my email list. On Instagram, I think it's the same thing. You just click on the link in the profile. If you're on YouTube, um, the link is on my YouTube description. If you're on my blog already watching YouTube, then hey, there you go. <laughs> so you're already on my blog. So that's how you get on the email list. And then you get updates on what my webinars will be every Wednesday. You get Free working parents guide to financial freedom. And if you're interested in joining Finance Freedom Mastermind and actually joining a group of people and getting a financial freedom coach, we have finance freedom coaches that do coaching once a month with all members, where we do your network, your passive income generation, your cash flow, and your financial freedom account. We chart those on a monthly basis because what you focus on, your attention on, will grow. And we want your cash flow, your network. Your financial freedom account and your passive income to grow every month so you can become financially free as quickly as possible. Thanks for heart. Thanks for what? Thank you for so joining it. If you want to join Finance Freedom Mastermind, also go to my blog because there are links there to go to join a Finance Freedom Mastermind. All right? So definitely get on my email list. You can contact me through email. It's an easy way to do it. You can message me as well, though I'm not as good as messaging as my email. So join the email list, get on there, learn about the topics, tell me what you think, yeah? And um, definitely visit my blog. There's tons of information on financial freedom. I hope you become financially free as quickly as possible. Thanks for joining me, and I will see you again next week, Wednesday. Aloha. Bye. You're welcome. Bye-bye.